For a tragically brief time in the 1920s, Rudolf Valentino romanced the world. The Latin lover was one of the biggest stars on the silver screen, and when his life was cut brutally short at the height of his fame, the fallout was legendary. But behind his sad, soulful eyes lurked secrets that were even darker than his infamous end. Valentino's marriage to dancer Natasha Rombova was tempestuous. Towards the end, he even banned her from the sets of his movies. And that bad blood didn't end when his life did. When he died, he left behind a cruel tribute to her. But we'll get to that soon. Despite his persona as a suave ladies' man and a Latin lover, Valentino claimed that his love life was tragic. He once confessed to a journalist, The women I love don't love me, and the others don't matter. According to the heart-wrenched Valentino, he was always unhappy in love. And when you see what happened to him, you might agree. Valentino was certainly no late bloomer, and even as a child, people commented on how good-looking he was. This had devastating effects on him. His mother spoiled him rotten and coddled her beautiful baby boy. This also drove a wedge between Valentino and his macho father, who thought his son was becoming a sissy. Tragedy would come to define the Latin lover's final years, but it was actually a part of his life from an early age. His older sister Beatrice passed when she was an infant, and his father died when Valentino was only 11 years old. Valentino knew he was destined for great things. He left Italy to seek out his fame and fortune in America, going through Ellis Island in December of 1913. He was only 18 years old. Obviously, unlike many Hollywood hopefuls, this fame and fortune actually happened for our sweet-faced Rudolph, but it came with a price. Valentino's spoiled childhood often came back to bite him in the butt. He was never a hard-working boy, and he'd never done well in school. These habits only became worse in the real world. While trying to make ends meet bussing tables in New York City, the teenage Valentino got fired from his job for, well, for not doing his job. Valentino's first few months in America weren't exactly a dream. In fact, they were a downright nightmare. Because he couldn't hold down a job or get an income, the aspiring actor often had to live on the streets. He survived by begging for food, even from the restaurant that had just fired him. But even from his reduced position, Valentino somehow managed to get himself into scandal. He took up work as a taxi dancer in a cabaret, and yes, that's just as racy as it sounds. The Hollywood hunk was a tango partner for hire, which wasn't exactly the most respectable occupation at the time, but it gets even juicier than that. While working as a dancer, Valentino met the unhappily married Chilean heiress Bianca de Salles, and it reportedly wasn't long before the Latin lover got a new Latin mistress. They started plotting her split from her husband, John, with Valentino even testifying at their divorce trial. And that's where things got really ugly. After the divorce went through, John DeSalles got a brutal revenge on his romantic rival. The tycoon called every political connection he had. He accused Valentino of being a gigolo, and he had him detained alongside his supposed madame. Valentino only ended up spending a couple nights behind bars, but the damage was done. Just after the scandalous divorce trial, Bianca fatally shot her ex-husband during a heated custody argument. Adultery, divorce, and now murder? It was too much for Valentino. He skipped town for the West Coast. And even more intrigue. Even before Valentino was famous, the ladies loved him. While trying to make it in Los Angeles, he was a lowly dance instructor, but somehow still won himself a retinue of wealthy older women who were more than happy to lend him their luxurious cars and perform other favors for him. Dirty dancing, anyone? Eventually, Valentino's smooth looks and suave vibes couldn't help but land him roles in Hollywood, just not the ones he actually wanted. Because he was quote-unquote exotic-looking, directors usually cast him as the villain or the gangster to begin with. But destiny was about to call on the Latin lover. Around this time, Valentino met the woman who would become his first wife, beautiful actress Jean Acker. But the relationship redefined Scandalous. Acker was actually a lesbian who married Valentino to escape a volatile love triangle with two other actresses. As you may have guessed, this didn't end well. Acker almost immediately regretted her decision. Like, very immediately. On the lovebird's wedding night, Acker locked Valentino out of their room and continued to refuse him forever after that. Their union was never consummated, and they separated very quickly, divorcing in 1921. Though, as we'll see... Not without a truckload more scandal. Sometime around 1920, Valentino started reading the best-selling novel The Fourth Horseman of the Apocalypse, 
by Vicente Blasco Ibanez. When he found out that Metro Studios had bought the rights to the film, he strode into their office with the intention of demanding a part in the flick. But what actually happened was much better. He found out that they were actually looking for him. Screenwriter June Mathis had seen Valentino's latest film and knew she had to have him for the part of Julio de Noyer, which was miraculously one of the lead roles in the ensemble cast. It was the part that would make Valentino, but it also broke him. Valentino's days on the set of The Four Horsemen were cold and cruel. Veteran director Rex Ingram signed on, but he had no faith in the green actor. The pair clashed continually. The studio wasn't much help either. They refused to give Valentino a raise and even made him pay for his costume. I wish I could say that they didn't do worse. After the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse became a bona fide blockbuster, Metro Studios somehow did Valentino even dirtier. Likely driven by Rex Ingram's dislike for the actor, they staunchly refused to admit that he was a star, even though he now was. But they relegated him to a B-movie for his next project, The Dud, Uncharted Seas. Valentino was a spoiled brat at heart, and he had no problem stomping his foot when he didn't get his way. He left Metro Studios in a huff just as soon as he could, hooking up with famous Players Lasky instead, hoping to bite into even juicier parts and payrolls. To say that he got what he wanted would be a huge understatement. In 1921, Valentino became iconic. That year, he played the lead in The Sheik, as Sheik Ahmed Ben Hassan. The film didn't just define Valentino's legacy, it also changed culture. Valentino's sultry acting in the film gave the word chic a new meaning, more than just an Arab title. After 1921, it denoted any irresistibly attractive man. At the time, there were countless men who imitated Valentino's distinctive, heavily pomaded hairstyle and adopted his general demeanor. These guys were not so affectionately referred to as Vaselinos. Like so many of the mysterious ladies' men who came before him, Valentino wasn't the easiest person to get along with. Our forever spoiled brat soon became frustrated at famous players Lasky for their low salaries, even though he was making a bundle. Hilariously, Valentino went on a one-man strike to make his point, and it blew up in his face. After months of lawsuits resulting from Valentino's strike, the temperamental star went full diva. In an embarrassingly tone-deaf open letter he titled, Open Letter to the American Public, Valentino complained about his pitifully low pay, even though his weekly salary of $1,250 was what some Americans made in a year. Valentino didn't just feud with studios, he also cruelly wounded his best friends. After June Mathis discovered him, they started a long friendship and collaboration. Until, that is, Valentino rejected Mathis' screenplay for his upcoming film. Mathis was so offended, she didn't even speak with him for years. But if you think that's vindictive, just wait. At the height of his career, Valentino was so famous that even the most minute changes to his physique caused huge frenzies. In 1925, the fact that Valentino grew a beard for a film role became literal front-page news and sparked a sensation. The Latin lover would inadvertently come to play an intimate role in people's bedrooms, at least in spirit. In the 1930s, chic condoms came out, and they featured Valentino's silhouette on the packaging for years. Despite the fact that he became a household name in America, Valentino never became an American citizen and never officially immigrated to the country. This hot-blooded Italian stayed Italian. Women may have loved Rudolf Valentino, but men often felt extremely threatened by his more effeminate masculinity, particularly in America. There were frequent reports of American men walking out of Valentino's movies in disgust, leaving their swooning women behind them. Valentino was on top of the world as a sex symbol, but he carried around a dark secret. He was incredibly insecure about the criticisms that men lobbed at his version of masculinity. He would even carry around news clippings that discussed his particular appeal so he could pull them out and criticize them. This was a recipe for disaster. Even journalists were threatened by Valentino. In a Chicago Tribune piece, now infamous as the Pink Powder Puff article, the anonymous writer somehow blamed Valentino for a powdering station he'd come across in a bathroom. Valentino's response was not good. Enraged and newly insecure, Valentino wrote into the newspaper and challenged the writer to a duel. Well, as much as he could. Dueling was actually illegal at the time, so the Latin lover settled for a boxing match. The writer never answered, but eventually another newspaper's boxing correspondent, Frank O'Neill, agreed to fight in the original writer's place. 
But if O'Neill thought it would be a nice little publicity bout, he was very wrong. Valentino's trainer was none other than heavyweight champion Jack Dempsey, and the actor actually won the fight. And they say Rocky IV is unrealistic. One of Valentino's biggest pet peeves on set was, well, the set itself. He despised anything that he thought was fake, especially shooting on studio lots. He always pushed to film his movies on location whenever possible, and he wasn't above throwing hissy fits if executives dared to confine him to a soundstage for a project. When Valentino was filming the B-movie, Uncharted Seas, he met the woman who would change his life, though not exactly for the better. He and costume designer Natasha Rombova started a steamy affair on the set. The stylish, dark, and stormy power couple married in 1922. And then the Hollywood scandal really hit the fan. Mere days after his marriage to Rombova, Valentino got a rude awakening. Officers detained him and threw him in the slammer once again, this time for bigamy. In California, you have to wait a full year after divorcing to remarry. So in the eyes of the law, Valentino was still married to Gene Acker. Valentino and Rombova had to wade through some Romeo and Juliet realness to officially tie the knot. After Valentino posted bail, the couple still had to stay in separate apartments for another full year before getting married again in 1923. For all that effort, it's a darn shame that they turned out so dysfunctional. The reported problem with Valentino's wife was that, well, she was a stone-cold witch and everybody hated her. Rombova at least partially caused Valentino's fallout with June Mathis, and most of his other friends found her utterly controlling and toxic to his career. But that doesn't mean she deserved what was coming. The Latin lover was also an ardent dog lover. Never one to resist the opportunity for flair, he had an Irish wolfhound that he named Centaur Pendragon, and a Great Dane named Kabar. In August 1926, Valentino was on top of the world, but the bigger they are, the harder they fall. On the 15th, Valentino suddenly collapsed at the Hotel Ambassador in New York. He was rushed to hospital with what doctors would later identify as perforated ulcers, and he underwent a routine surgery. In a little over a week, he was dead. After having his surgery, Valentino developed infections and complications. In particular, a fatal case of pleurisy in his left lung. In a horrific and unethical move, the doctors chose not to tell Valentino about his prognosis, letting him believe that he was going to make it. Sadly, this only made the Sheik's final moments all the more heartbreaking. At one point, while bedridden and fatally ill, Valentino still couldn't forget bygone slights to his masculinity. He turned and asked the attending doctor, And do I now act like a pink powder puff? His doctor's reply was heart-wrenching. The medic, knowing full well that the star wasn't going to make it, responded that he was actually braver than most. Up until his very last breath, Valentino thought that he was recovering. He spent his last days talking with doctors about his future. Supposedly, among his last words before passing was, Don't pull down the blinds. I feel fine. I want the sunlight to greet me. On August 23rd, he went into a coma, and he didn't wake up. He was only 31 years old. When news of the star's passing went around, the streets erupted with grief and chaos unlike anything Hollywood had ever seen. During his funeral procession, there were over 100,000 people that came out to pay their respects and say goodbye to Rudolph Valentino. Valentino didn't stop causing scandal even after he died. Just before he passed, he was dating a new starlet on the block, Paula Negri. The two likely played up their relationship for mutual publicity, so when it came time for Valentino's funeral, Negri tried to take the spotlight away from him in the most embarrassing way. At Valentino's funeral, horrified fans watched as Paula made the day all about her. She theatrically sobbed through the entire service, fainted on his coffin, and proclaimed to anyone around who had listened that he had proposed just a few days ago, even though he probably hadn't. And she wasn't even done yet. According to actor Ben Lyon, on the day of the service, she demanded that attendants place an enormous flower arrangement on Valentino's coffin, which read P-O-L-A. Ah, oh, what a sweet memory of Rudolph. When United Artists Studio signed Valentino, they dreaded dealing with his infamous wife, Natasha. As a result, their contract made one cruel request. Rombova was banned from all his sets. Yeah, that's pretty bad, but it's probably worse that Valentino actually agreed to it. Maybe that helps to explain his final act of cruelty. Valentino and Rombova's marriage never really recovered from the whole you're contractually banned from seeing me thing. They divorced in 1925 but their bad blood didn't end when he died. 
Valentino passed away a year after their divorce, but luckily for him, he'd already updated his will. In that will, Valentino left Rombova one single dollar bill. Ouch. Ouch. 